Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, presented by Associates for Biblical Research. On Digging for Truth, we explore the reliability and historicity of the Bible. Now, today we're going to be talking with a regular guest on Digging for Truth. In fact, he's almost like a third host, uh, Associates for Biblical Research staff member and pastor, Brian Wendell. Well, Brian, welcome once more to Digging for Truth. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me back, Henry. It's always great to join you. I'll tell you, one of these days we're going to have you hosting from Canada. It's going to be, uh, <laughs> so you, you can ask me a bunch of questions. That'll be great. Uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, well, listen, today we're going to be talking about one of the kings of Israel. Uh, there were many kings of Israel in the northern and southern kingdoms. Uh, King Hoshea. So uh, as usual, Brian, uh, you have a lot to tell us about this king from archaeology and the biblical perspective. So let's uh, jump right in the pool and get going. All righty. Well, Hoshea was the final ruler of the northern kingdom of Israel. He reigned from about 732 to 723 BC, uh, right up to the fall of Samaria. And uh, this is what the Bible says about uh, Hoshea's reign. This is the summary of his reign. It says this, In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, the son of Elah, began to reign in Samaria over Israel, and he reigned nine years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Yet not as the kings of Israel who were before him. Against him came up Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, and Hoshea became his vassal and paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria found treachery in Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt, and offered no tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria invaded all the land and came to Samaria, and for three years he besieged it. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and on the harbor, the river of Gozan, and the cities of the Medes. And that was the end of the northern kingdom of Israel. And despite reigning less than a decade, there actually is a considerable amount of archaeological evidence attesting to various um, details of Hoshea and various events in his reign. Well, that's excellent. That's an excellent uh, sort of survey of what we're getting there. Now, in that biblical text, obviously, you've touched upon Assyria and the king of Assyria. And so uh, immediately people are going to think, OK, we've got some background going on here, obviously, in the biblical text, specific mentions, but also the background. Give us a little sketch of what, what's happening here in this time in history and its interrelation with the text you just read. Yeah, so at this point in history, the uh, people of God have split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and they have been split for a considerable period of time. And, um, and so you've got uh, Hoshea reigning in the north uh, over the uh, kingdom of Israel. And um, there are a number of other smaller kingdoms at this time that, that are around as well. Uh, you've got obviously Judah to the south, you've got the Philistines to the southwest, you've got um, the kingdoms uh, to the north, and the big player, the big empire that everybody is concerned about is the kingdom of Assyria. And Assyria had essentially annexed a lot of the kingdoms to the west into its empire and made them vassal states. And so when it talks about Hoshea paying tribute to, um, to the king of Assyria, that's what's happening at this period of time. Assyria is the dominant world power um, at this point in history. Yeah, that's, that's very good, Brian. So um, obviously we know about Assyria from our, the archaeological record, from their records, and of course the record of the Bible. So let's, uh, let's start. You, you want to talk about Hoshea's servant. This is very interesting. This is, I love, this is what I love about these things. It's not just these major figures like the king, but even others that are mentioned. Tell us about his servant. Well, that's right, Henry. And sometimes these minor figures, because they left behind seals or seal impressions, attest to the major figures. And that's what we have with the seal of Hoshea's servant, Abdi, uh, an ancient seal bearing a Paleo-Hebrew inscription belonging to Abdi, servant of Hoshea, was purchased at a Sotheby's auction in 1993 for 80 thousand dollars. It's a tiny 
translucent brown cornelian scaraboid seal that includes the image of a man wearing a kilt with a short wig. He's holding a papyrus scepter. Uh, at the bottom, you see the very famous um, image, the Egyptian winged sun disc. This had become prominent on uh, on Hebrew seals. If anyone has ever seen the seal of uh, of Hezekiah, the king of Is- of king of Judah, you would have seen the the winged sun disc as well. And um, and it has this interesting uh, title. It says it says that he was the Ebed, the servant of the king. And that title always means that it's a, it's a royal servant that is happening. And so we know that that Hoshea is a king. Now, there was only ever one Hebrew king named Hoshea. He was the final ruler of the king of kingdom of Israel. And epigrapher Andrew Lemaire has noted that the Paleo-Hebrew writing on the seal fits well with other dated inscriptions from the last third of the 8th century BCE. Now, anytime we have artifacts that are purchased on the antiquities market, there is skepticism, and rightfully so, because there have been many fakes on the antiquities market. However, the general consensus with this particular seal is that it is indeed authentic. And if it is, that provides extra biblical proof of the historicity of King Hoshea. Wow, $80,000, huh? That's quite a bit of <laughs> that's quite a bit of loot for a little teeny seal. Who would have known from the ancient world that, uh, you know, the thousands of years later it would be worth such a thing? Now, uh, Brian, we've got about a minute in this segment. Maybe you could make some quick commentary about just the, the general connections that we know, the accuracy of the chronology of this time period. Maybe just tell the audience a little bit about Assyrian chronology versus biblical. Uh, just give them a flavor on that. Sure. Well, we are very thankful that the Assyrians left so many written records, and they would um, name every year after a person uh, called a limu. These are limu lists. And uh, because uh, one of the limu uh, lists includes um, a reference to an eclipse, we are able to date it, and we are able to actually have about 250 years of Assyrian chronology now absolutely dated to our modern dating system. And because there were interactions between the Assyrians and Hebrew kings, that dating helps us then date the Hebrew kings. In fact, uh, Edwin Thiele was able to lay out an accurate chronology of the entire uh, monarchy of Israel, both the united monarchy and divided monarchy because of that. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good survey. It really shows us uh, the extreme accuracy of the chronology of the divided kingdom period the eyewitness nature of it, the reliability of the Hebrew text that's been preserved for us. It's really quite remarkable. All right, well, friends, we're going to go to a break, and we'll be right back after this message. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device or go to our website, lighthousetv.org, for more information. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your host, Henry Smith. I'm here with Brian Wendell, and we're talking about archaeological evidence related to King Hoshea, who was the last king of the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay, Brian, let's get back to the archaeological evidence. Uh, What else do you have for us that's uh, fascinating and interesting? I know it won't be boring. I hope not. Um, King Hoshea is attested in the annals of uh, some of the Assyrian kings, including the royal inscriptions of King Tiglath Pileser III. Summary inscription number four was an inscription that was found uh, on a pavement stone by Austin Henry Laird uh, during excavations at Kala, and he made this uh, paper squeeze of the inscription, and, and the inscription and the squeeze were lost, but George Smith, thankfully, had already... 
copied it down. And so we have a copy of this, and in it, it reads this, the land of uh, Bit Humria, which is literally Omri land, that's what they called Israel, and all its people, to Assyria I carried off, Pekah their king I killed, and Hoshea as king I appointed over them. Now, this affirms some details in the biblical record because the Bible does talk about um, about Hoshea usurping the throne when Tiglath by Eliezer III attacked Israel. 2 Kings 15, 29, 30 says this, In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath by Eliezer, king of Assyria, came and captured Ejon and Abel, Beth, Makkah, Genoa, Kadesh, Hatzor, Gilead, and Galilee, and all the land of Naphtali. And he carried the people captive to Assyria. Then Hoshea, the son of Elah, made conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Ramalia, and struck him down and put him to death. And he reigned in his place in the place in the 20th year of Jotham, the king of Uzziah. So the the Assyrian text actually uh, illuminates the biblical text because it indicates that Hoshea had sworn allegiance to uh, Tiglath-Pileser III in exchange for helping him secure the throne. And so that's what Tiglath-Pileser III is alluding to. And so it appears that Hoshea remained a faithful vassal to Assyria during the days of Tiglath-Pileser III, but rebelled when the new king took the throne, as often happens. Uh, that's excellent. That's excellent. We should mention that uh, uh, you and I did an episode on Tiglath-Pileser III, uh, as, because he was so important that we did a whole show on that. So if people want to see the interrelationship between what we're talking about and that king and his importance, they can uh, check that out on our YouTube channel. Okay, so Brian, uh, Hoshea engages in this, you know, this revolt against Assyria. Uh, there's another dimension of all of this. Uh, what, what, what do we know about this uh, revolt? Sure. Well, according to the biblical text, um, Hoshea initially paid tribute to the new Assyrian king, who was Shalmaneser V. And soon, though, he decided to revolt. Apparently, he turned to Egypt, to So, the king of Egypt. We believe he was likely Osorkin IV, um, and he turned to him for support and rebelled against uh, Syria. We read about this in 2 Kings chapter 17, and as often happened, When a king rebelled, this brought swift retribution from the Assyrian king who marched to Israel. He laid siege to uh, Samaria for three years and eventually took the Israelite uh, king as prisoner and, according to 2 Kings 17, 5 and 6, deported the Israelites to Assyria. Now, it's interesting. The uh, biblical text seems to indicate that the Uh, The fall of Samaria is attributed to Shalmaneser V, and there are some ancient documents that might seem to support this. We have the Babylonian Chronicle, uh, ABC 1, in the British Museum, which records on the 25th month of Tibetu, Shalmaneser in Assyria and Akkad ascended the throne. He ravaged Samaria. So that seems to indicate and affirm exactly what the biblical text indicates. The eponym chronicle for Shalmaneser's reign, where it goes year by year, though, is damaged at that particular point in history. So we don't really know what was happening in 725, 724, 723 uh, BC in that time frame. Um, it, the, the, the name, the enemy's name and location are missing from these campaigns that it seems that he that he took. Now, scholars have noted out, isn't that interesting? We have three years missing. We have the biblical text suggesting that he laid siege to Israel for three years, and they have suggested that the missing enemy name, the missing location in the eponym text should be Samaria, that that would make sense with what uh, the biblical text says. But here's the thing. Uh, Shalmaneser only reigned for a short period of time. He reigned for five years, and then he died, and Sargon II uh, took the throne. Uh, That's interesting. So a couple things you're saying there. One is you you mentioned the biblical text kind of fills out what's missing in the... the, uh, in the Chronicle. So sometimes it goes the other direction. Sometimes the biblical text doesn't give us all the information and the archeology span fills it out. So there's a, a nice interplay in there. Now, uh, so Shalmaneser is coming up right on the cusp of the final sort of defeat of the Northern Kingdom. So, uh, but then Sargon takes over the throne. 
uh, did I understand you right when you said that the, the biblical text seems to give Shalmaneser the credit, and so there's a little dispute about this in there? Maybe you could clarify that. Yeah, there wouldn't be any dispute, really, I don't think, except that we have writings from Sargon II, who claims to be the one who um, defeated Israel and did the final deportation. And so Interesting. it seems to be that we have these two conflicting documents. But um, as, as we can talk about after the break, there are ways that you can explain both of these things, um, especially when you start to analyze the Assyrian texts in greater detail. And when you notice that in the biblical text, um, the biblical text moves from talking about Shalmaneser V to simply talking about the king of Assyria. Oh, that, that's interesting. So it becomes a more generic reference. I, I suppose, you know, an analogy too could be like if you think about something like World War II. I mean, you had President Roosevelt was the president of the United States almost right up to the cusp of the, of the victory. And then... Uh, you have uh, President Truman taking over and finishing the war. Perhaps an analogy there that just sort of gives you the sense of, of that. You know, who takes credit for that, right? Is it President Truman or is it President Roosevelt? Maybe, maybe that's a way to understand it as well. Well, we'll explore some of this more in our next segment. Uh, friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. We'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm here with Brian Wendell. We're talking about King Hoshea of the Northern Kingdom of Israel. Okay, Brian, I, I was... Uh, uh, rather, a little clumsily trying to bring about a, a modern analogy, perhaps World War II, President Roosevelt, President Truman, you know, sort of who takes credit for the end of the war. Uh, same thing here with the, with the destruction of the Northern Kingdom, I think, uh, kind of an idea, but I would like you to flesh that out some more because we want to remain faithful to the biblical text and the evidence that we have. Yeah, and part of the problem with this is that there is some... Um, some confusion around the transfer of power from Shalmaneser to Sargon II. It's, it's somewhat obscure. It appears that Sargon II was a usurper, that he, uh, he led a coup to take the throne. And, um, and so in his inscriptions, uh, he repeatedly claims to be the person who uh, conquered Israel. In the great uh, summary display inscription from his palace at Khorsabad, he boasts this way. He says, I besieged and conquered Samaria. I took his booty, 27,290 people who live there. I set my governor over them, and I imposed upon them the same tribute as the previous king, who we know was Shalmaneser V. Similarly, on a cuneiform uh, cylinder from Nimrod, Sargon declares that he deported the Israelites to Assyria and that he resettled Samaria more densely than before and brought people from the lands of my conquest. I appointed my eunuch over them as governor and counted them as Assyrians. Um, now, here's, here's the thing. Uh, first of all, that is affirming what we know from the biblical text, that uh, the, the Israelites were deported and that the Assyrians brought other people conquered uh, from other parts of the empire to resettle Israel. But scholars have noted that Sargon's claims to capturing Samaria come from much later in his reign, um, year 15, year 16, and Bible scholar Edwin Thiele um, noted, he said, if it is indeed a fact that Sargon captured the city of Samaria at the beginning of his reign, the question may well be asked why it took him so long to remember this fact. And others have pointed out that he was busy in Assyria making his claim to the throne secure in the first year of his reign, and he couldn't have been capturing Israel. And so you've got these two different um, kings, Shalmaneser and and Sargon, 
and um, and both are attributed uh, in ancient texts uh, to the final defeat of Israel. Fascinating. Fascinating. Well, that's good. You know, you know, sometimes we have these kind of things that we have to wrestle with, you know, being sure that we understand the biblical text correctly. Of course, that's primary, but looking at all the evidence, not jumping to conclusions, which often is the case that we find. We have to be careful, even as Christians, not to jump to conclusions in favor of our position, but, you know, carefully weighing the evidence. Okay, so, uh, Brian, uh, tell us more about this. I mean, what, what's your thought ab about some of this? What do you think is the best solution, quote unquote, and what happened to King Hoshea? Yeah, well, let's deal first with the first question. Who, who conquered Israel? That's the, the, the $64,000 question. Who conquered uh, Israel? Um, and you've got, as we've said, the Bible seeming to attribute it to Shalmaneser and Sargon in his records um, saying that he conquered Assyria. Of course, you've got the, 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 uh, Babylonian Chronicle, which talks about um, Shalmaneser um, ravaging Israel. And so how do we put all of this together? Well, one, um, one way to do that is to notice that in the biblical text, Shalmaneser is named as the Assyrian king who invaded the land of Israel and imprisoned Hoshea. That's in 2 Kings 17 verses 3 and 4. And then it changes a couple of verses later to just the generic term, the king of Assyria, who is credited with carrying off the Israelites. And some scholars have suggested that maybe that king of Assyria is Sargon, who is comes in two verses later as the one who does the final cleanup of the operation. A more probable explanation may be that Shalmaneser... Um, conquered Israel, but died shortly thereafter before he could make any monuments because Sargon led a coup and took the throne and then decided late in his reign that he was going to claim that he was the one who indeed had conquered Israel. Kenneth Kitchen explains it this way. He says, following Shalmaneser's very brief reign, which ended before any account of his last year could be monumentalized, Sargon II replaced him in a coup d'etat and subsequently claimed the capture of Samaria for himself much later in his reign. This was certainly a propaganda exercise to cover the gap in military successes that would otherwise defigure the accounts of his reign. The mere three months of his accession year were not adequate to run a campaign, nor the season suitable. The internal strife occurred upon, uh, and internal strife occurred upon the first year of his reign. So later, analysts had to cover all of this up by attributing Shalmaneser's capture of Samaria to Sargon. I think that is probably the more realistic explanation of what may happen. Now, what happened to Hoshea? We don't know. Yeah. He was taken captive. Uh, nothing conclusively is known about his death, although I suspect he probably perished in exile uh, somewhere wherever he had been resettled by the Assyrians. Yeah, yeah, that's something. I like the way that you've laid that out. Now, we've gotten into some nitty-gritty here, uh, but it's for the purpose of, of showing people that we do have to be careful with how we study these things and, and that the we have to... Uh, uh, look closely at the evidence and the biblical text, and also that sometimes kings did put forth often propaganda, and so you have to sift through that, uh, the wheat and the chaff, as it were. Um, but you can do that with multiple lines of evidence. I think propaganda kind of gets discovered if you have multiple pieces, which I think you've gone through very carefully here. Uh, but okay, Brian, so uh, we're down to our last minute. Uh, please give us uh, a, a summary of why this is important and uh, maybe a lesson about King Hoshea. Well, the Assyrian data is interesting because it, first of all, affirms King Hoshea. It affirms different things from his reign, uh, his ascension um, through a coup taking the throne in the days of Tiglath-Pileser uh, the third, that's affirmed both in the biblical text and the Assyrian text. Obviously, there's this confusion surrounding who actually was the Assyrian king who finally defeated um, Israel. And I think there are ways that you can look at both the Hebrew text and the uh, Assyrian texts, not just um, the, the writings of Sargon himself, but also the uh, 
Babylonian chronicles and go, hey, there are ways that we can explain how this all fits together. Finally, I think we should maybe just finish by noting that uh, the compiler or the writer of the book of Kings ends his account of Israel's history by noting that the fall of Samaria was God's judgment upon his people for their sins. And I think that's important when we read the account in 2 Kings 17, that we understand that this came about because of people's sins, which to me is a reminder that um, the sin of the sin problem that we all have and yes. the reason that we need Jesus, because his sacrifice was what covered our sins. And if we would ask for forgiveness and put our faith in Jesus, we can be saved and escape God's judgment. Amen to that, Brian. Thanks again for a stellar job and coming on the program. Appreciate you. You're welcome. Friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. Have a wonderful day.